Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Southwest Affiliate Stroke Boot Camp Series. We are excited to offer this 15-week course as a way to educate stroke coordinators in key components of their role, provide tools and resources to build and maintain successful programs, and to assist in building a large network of peers. Before we get started, we would like to go over a few housekeeping items. To avoid background noise, all lines have been placed on mute. For the question portion at the end of the presentation, you may unmute your line by pressing star 6 or typing in the Q&A section of WebEx. Please note you will only be able to claim your CE credits at the end of the 15-week series on September 27th. The copy of today's slides and any handouts will be sent to you within a week of today's call. For future webinar registrations, please visit www.heart.org forward slash SWA quality. Today we have a great speaker who will be discussing how to get small hospitals stroke ready. Martha is a Canadian nurse who has worked in five countries in pediatrics, orthopedics, ICU, PACU, and ED before coming to rural Texas in 2009 and beginning to work at Connolly Memorial Hospital in Forestville, Texas in 2011. Connolly's Memorial is a county hospital licensed for 44 beds, 45 minutes outside of San Antonio. Two years later, she was asked to start the stroke program. The hospital gained its level three stroke ready designation with the state of Texas 18 months later and won the Silver Plus Stroke Award from American Heart Association the following year. If you are from a small facility looking for direction and stroke designation and merit, you are in the right place. And now I will hand it over to you, Martha. Good morning, everybody. Oh, good afternoon. And uh, welcome to uh, getting a small hospital ready for stroke uh, for a stroke program. I have no financial disclosures or uh, relationships to declare, so I'll just move on beyond that. I want to welcome everybody to this. If you're watching this, then you're probably in the same boat that I was in a couple of years ago when I knew nothing about stroke, had never worked in a stroke program, uh, never been in a hospital that had a stroke program, and I started to do my research from scratch and said, what do I do now? So our objectives today are to look at why a small hospital uh, is so important to the stroke program of the country, of the, of the state, of your, of your county. Number two, the strategies for stroke program development in the small, small hospital, some things that we can do to make it uh, run a little smoother. Number three, the important first steps to get a stroke team member, uh, to get a stroke team member focused on performance improvement, peer review, and multidisciplinary planning. Just some details on how to make a program um, develop towards the goals that we have in mind, and practical options for organizing daily, weekly, and monthly priorities of a stroke coordinator. When I was uh, trying to get all this organized, I really, really leaned heavily on some people who taught me a lot of um, things about stroke, about how to do the program, and I want to uh, acknowledge them. Uh, one of them was Deb Mott, who is the uh, American Heart leader in this endeavor, and I just want to thank her for all the input that she put into our program and into my life in particular. So being a small hospital, sometimes we think we're not that significant. We have less staff, less resources, less practice. We, we don't have the specialties available to us, and we feel like the small dog among the really big dogs. And believe me, just being outside of San Antonio with um, um, primary hospitals and now just recently comprehensive hospitals just 45 minutes away, we really did feel like, what am I doing here at the table? But it really, really is important because the small hospital has a huge role to play in stroke care for the state and the, and the country. American Heart says that 97% of stroke deaths occur in low to middle income countries where 80% of the population live in rural areas. The rural po population has been identified as being particularly vulnerable to stroke, partly, partly because of lifestyle, partly because of, um, in Texas particularly, you know, we're kind of lone star, we're lone um, rangers and we're, we're just going to buckle up and ride it through and that's not the best approach when it comes to stroke. You want to get to a, a facility as soon as possible. The development of adaptive models implementing best practice for stroke management in rural areas is important because you're the first line of access. The, the CDC um, says that Americans living in rural areas are more likely to die from the five leading causes than their urban counterparts. Many of these deaths are potentially preventable. Heart disease is, of course, on the list. Cancer is on the list. Unintentional injuries, chronic respiratory disease, and stroke. All of these um, 
are preventable to some degree by lifestyle and definitely by early intervention. And sometimes, you know, we live in a county where some ambulances are going to have to ride 45 minutes to get to your location. So early access is really, really difficult, and I'm sure that some of you can identify with that as well. Public health research found that more than 86,000 deaths in rural areas could have been prevented with better public health resources and access to appropriate care. So, you know, just getting to the hospital, of course, is important, and if you're in a small hospital, you know that you deal with whatever comes through the door and you do the best that you can, and sometimes um, you just wish you had more more education, more resources, more, more available, more hands on deck. And uh, this graph shows that the metropolitan areas have less deaths from stroke than the, 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 urban, the uh, rural areas. Sometimes we might think that's just because there's, there's more, but actually there's more stroke that comes to the emergency room in the, in the cities but there's more deaths in the rural areas. I know that there's more research that has recently been done to kind of challenge that statistic, but um, I'm going to take that as what I found when I was doing my research. So I do have a recent, a real brief poll for you. I want to find out who I'm talking to. I want to know what size is your hospital. Is it less than 50 beds? Is it 51 to 100 beds? Is it 101 to 250 beds or more than 250 beds? If you could just enter the appropriate um, letter based on your hospital, we could get a, uh, some feedback on that. Take a few seconds here. Great, so Martha, the majority chose option C, 101 to 250 beds. All right, so the majority of you are um, 101 to 250 beds, so they're a little bigger than I am, than, than we were uh, when we were developing, developing this program. But um, that doesn't mean that a lot of the things that I'm going to go through, if you are not a comprehensive uh, program, then you're going to have to deal, look at a lot of the things that, that we looked at. I don't have my screen back yet. There we go. So less than 100 beds is what I was, I was looking at. So if you're 101, a little bit more often we have um, an ED staffing of a doctor, and that's the only doctor in-house uh, for 18 hours of the day, two to four nurses, and perhaps a tech or a, um, a clerk. So that's really not a lot of people if you have an, um, a stroke alert going on. In fact, I've been in our emergency room. We had two stroke alerts going on, two stroke alerts going on at the same time. And it definitely, you want all hands on deck because you need to do things and you need to do things fast. So being resourceful about um, that you don't just have your own little niche in the, in the team. You know, when a stroke alert happens, we will use our RT techs to do things um, that might be outside of the scope of what they had originally thought, but it's all hands on deck on a small hospital. And, um, you know, anybody will take the labs to the lab. It's just a matter of using the best use of the resources that you have. And if you're a small hospital, you're familiar with that. So why is the small hospital stroke program so important? It's time, time, time. We all know that. If you've been doing these um, WebExes, you already know that time is brain and that the sooner we can make the right decision, the sooner we can go to the right place, the sooner we can preferably get the right outcome. Um, the treatment decision is made usually within the first 30 to 45 minutes, hopefully 45 minutes. If you have um, your timelines, you know that everything needs to be back to the physician so he can make an appropriate decision within 45 minutes. And doing that in a small hospital is very challenging. But we found that with practice, that was definitely doable. Also making a decision, a decision, destination decision. It's important to make that decision early because you have an ambulance ride, you have to call the ambulance, the ambulances locally aren't available, they have to come from 45 minutes away, and you've decreased your time. You may use a helicopter to try and expedite that, but that may not always be an option depending on weather and your location and availability. So the sooner you can make these decisions, the sooner you can make the right decision, the right treatment decision, the right destination decision, the better the outcome will be. And outcome is what we're looking at. And it's, um, trying to decrease the disability and the death related to stroke. That's our goal for everything that we do. 
brief look at Texas, which is obviously where I am. I'm going to describe this is Texas, and each of those numbers is um, the, the, air, the rack that we're in. And we're in T rack, which you can see in the left area there in that red circle. When I started looking at getting designated by the state, I thought, well, there must be somebody close to me that could help me walk through this. And as I looked, in 2014, there was only 11 hospitals in all of Texas that were um, level three or stroke ready. And they were none of, them, none of them were near me. The little green arrows that you see in the upper right-hand corner, those indicate the level three stroke ready hospitals, which are the smaller hospitals that don't have a neurologist and, and really it's very difficult for us to get a higher level of uh, certification or designation. So in our whole South Texas, uh, we became the first in that area. Since then, there has been another, and it's slowly becoming um, more, there's been more and more interest, and I'm very happy to have this boot camp because it makes it accessible to those who can't necessarily travel to bigger locations to get this information. But every small hospital in a rural area could get certified if they just took the time to do the education, put the protocols in place, and run some mocks. Uh, yes, there are some, some some other facilities, or other departments that are important, like you must have a CT 24 hours a day, a CT tech 24 hours a day. You have to be able to run a PT INR at any time during the day and um, day or night. And so, um, and you have to have TP, TPA available in the emergency room. So those kind of things, but those are doable for most of us. Um, so I, I just encourage that if you're a small hospital in some rural area and you think it's not is not doable, it is doable. We're 44 beds. We typically have less than 25 patients in our uh, inpatient area, and our ICU is minimally, it's only four beds. Of those four beds, usually only one or two are occupied, and sometimes none. We have 10 emergency room beds, and still uh, we were able to, to get this designation within 18 months, and I don't think that we are exceptional. I think that anybody could do it. And I, as, you, as we progress, you're gonna see that this made a huge difference in the care of stroke that we delivered from our facility. STRAC, which is South Texas Regional Advisory Council, which is the RAC that we were in, uh, was very crucial in helping me get to where, or helping our facility get to where we were. A lot of networking with the other regions and the resources helped. I mean, so don't go this alone. Like you have to do it all alone. There's always somebody you can buddy with. There's a lot of educational offerings that, um, that I went to. One of the best ones was the, was the uh, the boot camp that was offered where, where Deb was the speaker and uh, told us how to use, uh, get with the guidelines. So that was a, an exceptional opportunity and it really did help me to get my feet on the ground. Those educational offerings are offered sometimes outside of your area. They might be a little driving distance, but most of the larger hospitals will have a neurological education weekend or day once a year because it's required. And if you can get connected with them, and attend theirs, you're going to you're going to learn a lot, and it's going to help you stay on track with what is already being communicated to the larger hospitals about what the expectations are for stroke care. Facilitating the collecting of regional statistics, the RAC was really great about that. Rather than us having to submit all of our, reg our registry to the state, we submitted it to the RAC, and the RAC did, um, submitted it to the state for us, and that took one step out of it because. As a stroke coordinator in a small hospital, you probably have multiple things that you're doing. You're not just being a stroke coordinator, and you don't have the time to do um, to do all the details. You don't have all the uh, three auditors to do your auditing for you, or um, people to send stuff for you. So you have to do it all alone, and you have to be creative about how you do that. So having the rack available, um, or whatever group that you're a part of, and working together with them makes it can take one thing off of your plate. Also promoting the process improvement through shared knowledge. I mean, we did uh, PI, our PI meetings. Whatever problem we were facing, typically was faced by the other hospitals as well. So jointly coming together, discussing possible solutions, really crucial, really crucial in um, finding an answer that was doable for all of us. One of the things that they also offered was a buddy mentoring system. For new stroke coordinators, you could log in or you could request uh, a buddy who had been through the process already and would help answer your questions and guide you along the way. Very helpful. And the local resource for expert knowledge. You're going to have to bring knowledge back to your facility. So networking with a larger group gives you access to people who you can then invite to come back to your facility and do your, your four hours of stroke training for the year. 
and bring all your people up to speed so you don't have to do it all yourself. You can bring in the experts and they're usually very happy to do that. Strategies for stroke program develop it, development in rural hospitals. This is our story. This is not everybody's story, but this is how I learned, so this is how I'm going to tell you how it worked for us. In 2002, our facility made a commitment to stroke. They would voluntarily report, report stroke core measures, and there was stroke training added to the annual competency, but it was at a very basic level. And NIH training was offered to all nurses uh, through an electronic method, an independent study, but it wasn't required. The next year, they increased that commitment by adding telehealth partnership provided through telehealth stroke consult so that we had a neurologist available in the emergency room through telehealth who could help us make good decisions. NIH was required by all the ED nurses. The community awareness of CM, our, our hospital stroke capabilities was done through um, newspaper advertising and um, some of the public events that we had. We would have a booth there to just say that help them be aware of what, how to recognize stroke and that we were capable of dealing with it. They didn't have to just bypass us to go to a larger facility. We also um, joined the Get With the Guideline Stroke Registry Program, which helped us to know in the data collection, they guided us to what's important data to collect, how to analyze it, and abstracting um, the stroke information. That was very helpful in helping us to know, okay, what's the important questions to ask. That's a, that's a process that if you're starting from scratch with a spreadsheet or a some kind of audit tool, you're going to find that at the end of the year, oh, they're going to ask me that question and I never thought to ask that. Like one simple one was how many of our transfers were by air and how many by ground. It wasn't the question I was asking, so that first year I had to go back and look through all my strokes and say, okay, how many went by ground, how many went by air. Now I know that that's something I need to collect, but Get With the Guidelines did a lot of that work for me. And then um, that was what the hospital did in the November that year. They hired me as the stroke coordinator and I started doing my research on how we could improve our program and get to a designation of stroke, stroke ready. We also had a speech therapist available occasionally, but we increased her to five days a week, so that helped us with our assessment. We developed a mission statement for our program, which was to reduce the incidence and impact of stroke in Wilson County through implementation, monitoring, and improvement of evidence-based care of stroke patients and the education of those impacted by or at risk for stroke. That included our emphasis on the community education, which you're going to find is uh, important when you come to survey. It's important to uh, educate your, your community about what capabilities you have, but also how they can sooner recognize stroke and what to do and what not to do when they do recognize it. So that following year, uh, we appointed a stroke medical director, developed a stroke committee, the stroke team or stroke committee was sent to the STRAC emergency conference, which is, again, one of the things that RAC did for us is they had an emergency conference which had four tracks, one for trauma, one for stroke, one for disaster, and one for heart. And so we had a whole track. If you went for the three days of the, the conference, you had all your CE, uh, CEs for the year, and you had some really good uh, current knowledge that was based on the best practice. We also, um, I, I went regularly to the stroke coordinators meeting at, the, at STRAC, which is our, it was in San Antonio, but it was where we all collaborated together for process improvement, for system problems, for how to, like for things like how to transfer quicker and better, how to communicate that better, how to get the person to the appropriate facility. All those conversations happened at the STRAC and were very helpful in developing our program. Community education that year, I was just trying to learn. They said you have to do community education, but they didn't say how much. They didn't say what it needed to look like. So we did a stroke lunch and learn, which um, we had been doing lunch and learns once a month at our facility already, so that, that drew about 75 people. We did a video um, of a stroke survivor that came to our facility and uh, her, her walk through her process of coming back to uh, functioning fully at her previous level, and that was made available through uh, YouTube, and we put it out there on our website. And that was just one way to get the story out. She was a very good candidate to do that. But then we heard that we would have to prove that we had done something to educate the public. In our, in our county, we would have to um, have some numbers for that. And I thought, what do I do? I have no budget. What do I do for that? So I just went to um, SurveyMonkey, and I put out some questions about FAST. And we started listing that out to every email that was in the community, and we got responses back. And so we were able to prove that they, the level of knowledge of how many people knew what FAST stood for and what, uh, that they could answer it correctly. And I'll show you a slide about that later. 
Another thing we did was stroke education and competency for our staff and for EMS. Don't forget the EMS. We don't own an EMS in our, facility, uh, in our hospital does not own a, an EMS. They're all volunteer and they're all in the county around us, but we don't have any direct um, responsibility for them. But we did reach out to them and included them in all of our education. So we had a, a four hours of stroke education, which was required by the ED staff and some of the um, unit staff that was for the inpatient areas, but particularly for the, for the ED and for, um, for the unit managers so that they could communicate that message down to their staff that what the expectations were for stroke care. Another thing was get with the guidelines training and baseline data collection. Um, if you go with get with the guidelines, it's a very good tool for gathering data, but you have to start with the baseline. So I had gone to the year prior to my hire and gone through everybody that had a stroke diagnosis and I had to have a minimum of 30 to enter into the system so that we had a baseline data so we could measure our progress against that. And uh, that took some work and some learning, but it's, it's the groundwork that needed to be done. And then we submitted our application. Remember, you can't wait till you're all ready until you submit your application. You do it as soon as you have the major pieces in place because it's gonna be about a year in advance that you're submitting the application. You have time after that to, to improve things, to correct uh, mistakes or develop stuff. So go ahead and submit that application as soon as you can. In 2015, we developed a support, uh, stroke support group. I say developed, we had, there had been one 20 years earlier and it had kind of become a bingo a night uh, rather than very educational. So we revived it and we re made it more stroke oriented with a, a component of education, a, of, a component of sharing and emotional support and, and some socialization. We started doing mock strokes. We did a competency, competency provided by the primary stroke center that was nearby, nearby us. We have, again, utilized those that are nearby that have more education, more resources, and have more experience with stroke. And we bring them into our community so that they can teach us what they know. And that's very helpful. We started our PI process. And uh, we did a mock survey again with a stroke coordinator from a primary stroke center who came and reviewed what we had done and what we had set up and gave us some encouragement and some tips on how to improve. We had our survey and got our designation with the, in 18 months. So although you may be small, don't be, don't be discouraged, you are trainable. And yes, that is my dog. Uh, although you may be small, you can still be really, really efficient. Sometimes, you know, having more is not always better. Just that being better, it always requires some work. Being small doesn't mean you're not effective. For those people that come through the door, you are effective. Uh, we had had our stroke designation for about six months when our, our CNO's brother came to our department. And this is a public story, so I'm not telling anything um, that's not already out in the public. He gave uh, a report about his care there. He came and he was seen and, and left the hospital with a not stroke diagnosis. He's 52 years old. and. 20 minutes later, they're in the, in the restaurant and he shows sign of facial drooping in the CNO, a friend of mine, but she's looking at him and she's thinking, what would Martha do? What would Martha do? And she, she remembered the things that we had learned and the things that had been, had been told to her and did exactly the right thing, brought him back to the emergency room. And he was assessed and had TPA and, um, and is a fully functioning adult now. And so, it really does pay off when you have stories like that. You can be effective, you can be good, you can make a huge difference in the lives of the people in your community by taking a, a, a directed role in how you, communicate the, how you communicate to your community, but how you train your facility and how you practice. You are not too small to make a big difference. So I know that this is taxing for many of you. You don't have 100% of your job at caring for stroke patients. So I'm going to ask you what percent of your job is dedicated to stroke for your facility? 25, 50, 75, or 100? So it looks like the majority is choosing D, which is 100%. 100%, that's amazing and that's awesome. Um, that means that your facility has, has bought into stroke care and, um, 
and that is that is great because when you have to, many of us in the past have had to share an ED shift or um, work for quality, and we do other things. Um, some are emergency room managers, and they also do this on the side. So having 100% dedicated to this really does make a difference, and I have to applaud my little hospital gave me uh, a good portion. I was 90% um, stroke, so that was that was great. Can you hear my screen back? There we go. So important, how do you make good use of your time? So the first important steps that you have to do is you have to get good data. I mean, you can, uh, you can collect a lot of data. There's a huge amount of data out there, but some of it's not going to be that important, and it's hard to know what's the most important thing. So focusing on performance improvement, that really makes a difference to the program, which will make a difference to the, the people that are affected by stroke. How to do a, a chart audit and review. Oh, that's a mistake, review, review. Well, that's not bad. You review, 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 and you get good data. Um, multidisciplinary planning. Don't do it all by yourself again. Help. Um, get the help of others in your facility. The more you, the more you include in your process, the more trained they'll be, and the more you'll have to move your program forward. The application will guide you with some of those goals. The appointment of which people, who needs to be um, at the table, who needs to be involved in the team. Um, the medical, stroke medical director, obviously, and yourself, the lab, the CT techs, and the unit managers, and then your, your people in the emergency room. Admin buy-in, obviously, if you're 100% in stroke, you already have admin buy-in, so that, that's a good thing. The educational requirements, this is going to be your headache, because um, the requirements for the state and you may be going with another facility, uh, another um, another designation, but we went with state, and there are requirements for the ED doctors is that they have eight hours of stroke designated education in every two years. That has been discussed to change that to a, a lesser amount, but it has not been changed, so that last survey we had that was still required. Um, although they were a little bit forgiving, we are very generous with that when we're looking at the education for the ED doctors because if you're like us, you have um, a revolving door of doctors. Many, many small hospitals have a company that supplies them and those doctors work in an area, so they may not be always at your facility and it's hard to get them to buy into your program, but to get them to do the education and get it to you is, is a recognized challenge. So I encourage you to not not wait with sending in your application until you have all those requirements. Tell them that you're working on it and continue to communicate with your doctors until you have them. We included a lot of things, though, with the education requirements. You could use anything that was related to hypertension, anything related to coagulation, anything related to neurology, and those specific stroke things. So um, look at all those things when you're looking at uh, the, the doctor's education. The nurse requirements. We took care of that with competency. At competency, we did TPA administration certification. We did uh, swallow study screening certification. And everything except the NIH was included in the competency. So if you intended the hospital competency, then you had the education required except for the ACLS and the NIH, which we could, um, ACLS, of course, was done at a separate time. And NIH was done through a self-study module. So that was, that was easy enough to do. Policies and procedures, keep them uh, simple. Don't make them over complicated. Improve your process and outcomes. The administrative structure changes are, are pretty much designated by the application uh, uh, guidelines that you can get. And how to monitor your stroke care and, and then go ahead and apply for the level three. We're going to go through this a little bit more. The key steps, the appointment of people. We already talked about that, stroke medical director, stroke program manager and the stroke team. I tried to use somebody from every department that was involved in a stroke alert, as well as the heads of department so that we could get a broad picture. And when we wanted to communicate process improvement, it was quite easy to get it to the different departments because they already heard it at the team, at the team level. Um, our, our meetings were, we're a very small facility, so having a meeting every month, every week, it doesn't make sense because people are on shift work and 
So we, we scheduled a meeting for every other month, which means this meant that we had it at least once a quarter, which met the requirements. And then we'd have smaller meetings in between times, like for instance, me and the stroke program, me and the stroke medical director and the ED manager would meet quite frequently if there was ever an issue and we would start working on a process before it ever went to the team. Um, you have to be creative that way because you, you're not everybody's working nine to five in a small hospital. There's a lot of um, variation in shifts. Education requirements, like I told you, NIH, Swallow Screen, ACLS, and CPA administration are activated. Policies and procedures, the basics are that you have to have a triage policy. Uh, how are you gonna triage people so that you catch, you want to have this net that's big enough to catch all your strokes, but you, uh, and like most triage, you want to have an, at least a 15 to 18% over triage. You wanna catch more than are actually strokes, which is hard for our ED to understand. They just wanted to do the minimum. It's like, no, we wanna catch a few more because we should be catching a few false negative, or um, false positive, and then we rule them out as something else and we take them out of the basket. But make sure that your net is big enough to catch 90 to 100% of your strokes. So that requires good triage questions. Uh, your stroke alert policy, what does that include? Who does that include? How does it run? Uh, your admission and transfer, who do you admit and who do you transfer? We did not keep any hemorrhagic strokes at all because we didn't have a neurologist there the capabilities of dealing with that. And we didn't keep um, anybody that was significantly affected that would need a neurology, a neurologist assessment um, beyond the first, after the first day. If they would benefit from uh, a neurology more often than that, we would definitely send them. If they were um, young, we tended to send them more often because we, we have PT every day, but we felt that sometimes there was PT that would definitely be better for them if it was specific for a stroke on a stroke unit, then we would transfer them. We transferred all of our TPAs. We never kept a TPA. And uh, we didn't keep, uh, we never kept, like I said, a hemorrhagic unless they are opted for comfort care measures only. That was the only reason that we would keep them then change them to hospice and keep them. But otherwise, we have to remember, what can you do, what can you do well, and what can you not do? And if you, de if you define that very well, it helps your ED doctors, your ED department to know, okay, let's start that transfer process going right away, or we can maybe admit this person. We did find that those admissions that came to us and stayed in the hospital that were local, that were like, you know, not severely affected, they had PT, they recovered a lot of their function within the first 48, 72 hours, they really did prefer to stay local, family could be close, they knew people, the same physical therapist that saw them in the hospital saw them as outpatient, that kind of thing, they really preferred to stay local. So not every, everybody is appropriate for transfer. And that needs to be well identified in the policy. Inpatient care, um, there's some very specific things that need to be done for inpatient care. We had to educate our hospitalists about that and our, our inpatient um, units. We did an NIH on admission and then we did it we did it every 12 hours for the first while, and then we changed it to every day, for, to daily. So we do an NIH daily to see if there was a, a change at all. And the, the LDL had to be checked, um, swallow study before anything is given, PTOTST is involved, and um, or antiqu uh, anticoagulants within the first 24 hours, and then the discharge teaching. Let me tell you right now that American Heart has been amazing for us as a small facility. We go to discharge teaching, well, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do? I went to the American Heart website for stroke and I went to their educational um, page for stroke and I downloaded and printed exactly what they had there and they made a packet that had everything that was required by the state to be taught. So our, we had a grab and go pack for discharge and it just had a page on the front that listed everything that was included in the pack that was signed off. And we had one little segment in there that we added, it's just like, okay, you're going home now. These are the things that we talked about that are um, gonna be affecting your life from here going forward. Do you recognize stroke? Do you know what to do when you have a stroke? Um, do you know how to call 911? Do you know how to manage your anticoagulants? But the one thing that we did ask them and we reported on that front page that we kept in their chart was, what's one thing in your lifestyle that you think that you could do differently that would decrease your risk of stroke? And I'm gonna tell you that that was very, important to survey when they came, that we had we had somehow taken something that was very packaged from the American Heart, but we had personalized it for ourselves, and they, they really like you to do that, so we'll keep that in mind. Improving the process and outcome. You have to audit, 
You have to evaluate what you audit, and then use your information to plan improvements, and then measure how you how you improve. And a lot of that Get With the Guidelines will help you with if you're using Get With the Guidelines or whatever tool you're using. Uh, and American Heart is very good at doing um, at helping us with that. Administrative structure changes. It's a change in culture because most of the doctors that came to our department, you know came from different countries, some of them, and sometimes came from different experiences, and, and many of them wanted to be original in their treatment of stroke and to try to make it like this is the policy, this is how we do it, this is the, this is the code set of what orders we, we, everybody has a stroke alert, these are the orders that we do on everybody. Don't be creative and try to do this one or not this one. Okay, we're going to do CT, we're going to do CT of the neck on this one. Uh, you know, just um, make sure that you include the things that are on the policy, and that's a culture change, and that's uh, having a good relationship with your ED doctors, getting buy-in from your ED um, administration so that, that you can make sure that that culture changes to say, let's catch these strokes. And one of the ways you do that, don't forget to celebrate the victories, I'm going to go into that a little bit later. And having a direct line of communication with the, with the stroke medical director, that has to show up on your org chart as well as in your relationships. You need to have a good relationship with your stroke medical director so that you can communicate the process improvement that needs to happen, and he can communicate that with the others, the other doctors, because they do really drive the team, although they take, in most situations, they take their cues from the stroke program manager. Monitor your stroke care. Develop the tools that will work for you. Don't make them too complicated, but make sure they capture what you need. Uh, develop team leads. One of the best things that came after our first survey and our first designation was that they, they encouraged us to develop stroke champions on each unit. And that was, that took a big load off of me because I felt like I was doing everything. And I got stroke champions. I incentivized them by taking them to some further education, um, gave them some uh, applause, but also gave them some responsibility. And they really, uh, it really helped. When I went on vacation, there was somebody to take over uh, auditing for me or monitoring stuff. So develop your champions and it'll help you. Okay, and go ahead and apply. The stroke team, admin buy-in, I've told you about that. Keep them in the loop, keep them in the loop of what's going on, um, what needs to happen in the next year. The stroke medical director, get someone of interest, someone who has a passion and not just someone who, who says yes, but's not really interested because that will be a hard, hard row to, uh, to hoe, I'm just, it's going to be, a, it, it's best if you get somebody that has good passion and good buy-in for strokes. And they're out there. Involve your radiology lab and RT, CT, OTSC, unit managers, quality, quality is a, a good partner to have in this process, and your stroke champions, I've already covered this, but I'm going to move on. Education, stroke alert criteria and process. When I first started this, that seemed to be uh, a moving target. I would send out a, a tool and say, okay, let's audit every stroke alert that comes in the door, and this is the tool we're going to use to measure it, and we did it. And then I'd learn a little bit more, and it's like, oh, we need to move, we need to change this audit tool. And they came a little frustrated with the, with the changing, uh, the moving of the goalposts. That why doesn't it just stay the same? So if you can borrow something from somebody else, learn from somebody else's experience, that's helpful, that you don't, um, have to keep on changing the criteria. It, it's out there, but it's best to partner with someone that's about your size or someone that's bigger than you in hospital size so that you can um, avoid those mistakes. The NIH, like I said, it's just a module that everyone does, and then they supply us with certificates. The swallow screen was taught by our PTO, uh, our ST. She came and, and made it quite easy for people to do. There was a simple policy that just here's the, here's the things that you need to do uh, in order to do a, a swallow study, and it was built into our electronic medical record within the first year, so then they could do it that way, and it would score for them. This is definitely a pass, this is definitely a fail. It was pretty foolproof. ACLS, Activase. Now the Activase training, it, it's best if it's done as a group or in person or one-on-one. -on -one. We did have a DVD that we played and we let people do it on their own, but we found that, that um, it's not really as useful as doing it in person, as doing hands-on. If you can keep an Activase um, vials and tubes from a previous admission so that people can actually practice and do it, the best case scenario. So that in a small hospital, you're not going to always, the pharmacy is not always there. There's not always somebody who's given it before. So practice is really important. Um, teleuse, that became something that helped us a lot because 
we had teleuse and it was very good, but it wasn't being used appropriately until we started to push and say, if that patient arrives in six hours of last known well, we encourage that you use telehealth because we want to, it's a good fail safe for the doctor to say, yes, this was a good choice or this is not a good, it was not a good decision. He doesn't have to be alone in making that decision unless it's obvious, of course. But if it's not sure and it's within six hours and we started just tracking those statistics and posting those statistics and we increased our tele-use from minimal to uh, about 80% of those that arrived within six hours were using tele and that helped us to make better decisions. So uh, if you have the tool, use it. EMS, we did a lot of EMS training in trying to get uh, scene times down to 10 minutes and to get them to call stroke alerts prior to arrival and based on what they, what they had assessed and to use a stroke scale to assess their patients before they arrived. So like I said, they were all volunteers and that was a, that was a bit of a feat, but we did manage to do that. Follow-up and procedures, I've gone over these. Um, triage, stroke alerts, admission transfers, inpatient care discharge. And then there's another policy that you'll need about how you're going to audit your strokes and the registry and the process improvement. Those are pretty much the basics that will be required for you if you're a small hospital looking for designation. Improvement process. What did we do to communicate a clear, our clear objectives to our end users, to our front line? And one of the most helpful things we did was to make um, a grab and go package in the ED department. It's just a, a grab and go. Here you just grab this. If you grab this in the glucometer, you can assess this patient. You can do the NIH, you can do the follow screen. You can, everything was in that package. Um, and we also color coded everything. Everything that we did uh, with stroke was purple. So there was a purple binder. Uh, we made badges that they, badge cards that they could attach to their ID badge that on there there was a, um, a stroke alert the times for each thing that they needed to do for a stroke alert, what was included in a stroke alert, um, how to assess. All those things were, were on their little badge so they could just look at it real quick and remind themselves because we don't do them that often in a small hospital. The first year we did, uh, we had 30 stroke assessments, uh, patients that were assessed for stroke in our ED department, and this last year there was 99. So it has gone up with public education and uh, we are happy to, to report that, but uh, it's not that often, and so people need signage, grab-and-go packs, and the badge helps were very helpful. We also had a grab-and-go pack upstairs because our inpatient strokes were even less frequent than our ED strokes. So we would have a grab-and-go purple pack there that would help them walk through the process because um, it, it was very infrequent. And again, your mock strokes help that situation. Time they audit, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the daily, weekly, and monthly um, schedules for the stroke program manager. Evaluate your care, involve the frontline people, and be outcome focused. Sometimes it becomes really uh, easy to focus on the little, little things that weren't done, and yes, sometimes um, there's a reason that it's not done. But let's look at the, out, out, the outcome, what happened with this patient. If you bring back news, if you can give them back information, you, know, you did this, you gave TPA, and he, he was discharged three days later from a large facility, and, and it was a great outcome. That's really encouraging, you know, because if they can see that what they're doing is making a difference, it helps them to uh, comply with those policies that we have in place. Measure your outcomes and communicate them. Um, to the EMS, I would report back to the EMS to say, hey, great. Great call on that last patient. Um, this is what I, you know, he was sent out and this is the outcome. As, as much as you can communicate with them, do so because it helps them to improve their process as well. Um, when you're planning your improvement, it can be tempting to be um, individual. You know, you were the charge nurse and this didn't happen, but you know, there's always a bigger picture of what happened in the emergency department, why it didn't happen. So try and, try and look at the system when you're planning your improvement. Look at, is there a system thing that we can change? Like, you know, um, is it a process we can change? It's not always that the person didn't just do it. Maybe that person was really busy with the next stroke in the next room. And um, if there's a process or a system thing that we can change, it helps a lot. We did a lot with our electronic medical record 
One of them was a, a stroke alert criteria. Okay, when do we call stroke alerts? What makes it what makes it good? What makes it not good? When's it right to call? And and why did we call on this one and not this one? And we went from calling none to calling on everybody that had a stroke in the last week. I mean, like there was that they would call a stroke on anybody that had any stroke-like symptoms that had been, and that was like, okay, that's that's too much. Let's narrow that. Now we're good. Now let's be more specific. So I gave them a stroke alert criteria in their triage packet. And in the electronic medical record, we built it in. It's, they did it quickly. Uh, Cincinnati face fast. They did a, a fast exam. They did a last known well. They did a last um, a discovery of symptoms and the gluc their glucose reading. And with those things, and it would automatically, a system would say, call a stroke alert or not call a stroke alert based on those those answers. So that kind of helped clarify for them a little bit, and we got better at calling stroke alerts that were appropriate rather than just exhausting everybody with doing a stroke alert on people that it didn't really apply to. So that was a system thing that we changed. We did it electronically and it worked. Um, using the telehealth more often, that was a system thing that helped us improve our stroke care. So look at the whole, whole picture and see if there's a system or a process thing that will make it easier for your end users to make the right decision and do the right thing. And of course, celebrate the victories. We're a small hospital. Can a small hospital make a difference? I can tell you that right now we we amazed ourselves. We gave CPA within 38 minutes of arrival. Um, that was our that was our best case scenario, and uh, a very good outcome on the on the patient. But 38 minutes is is that's that's something to celebrate. And so we did. We always we would when we had a TPA that was given within 60 minutes, we would come back the next day or the next time that team was on, we would celebrate it, take a picture, and post something in the in the um, newsletter of our hospital so that we could celebrate that. This is not unfamiliar to you if you've been doing stroke, so you know all about it. Um, the stroke timelines that we went for is onset of TPA, onset of symptoms uh, to TPA in less than three hours. And this is some of the stuff that was on the badge that I mentioned that we had, the purple badge that we gave people that they could put on their ID badge so they could just quickly look at it. What's the time for this? The patient has to be to the CT within 25 minutes. The patient has to have a CT interpretation within 45. I'm just going to say, as a small hospital, you know, your CT is around the corner from your ED, and if you if you like that, um, it's, it's quicker than it is in the big facility sometimes because it's just right next door and there's only three people in the ED that night. So we would, most of the time, we'd get our CTs done within seven to eight minutes, and our reports were very seldom that they weren't back within 25 minutes. Um, door to EKG lab and x-ray results was within 45 minutes. That was more difficult to get because our PT machine takes 30 minutes to spin and get a result. So 30 minutes out of 45, if you don't get the lab drawn and to the lab within the first 15 minutes, you're already late. So that became a challenge, but we got better at it. We, we changed our process. When they called a CT alert, we would do a glucose straight to the CT on the X-ray on the EMS stretcher. As soon as the CT is done, lab was encouraged to draw blood on the CT table so that they could start their process, and then we would take the patient back to the ED and do the EKG and start the IVs. Um, and doing that little thing helped us to get our PT INRs back within 45 minutes. Um, we may extend the onset of, of TPA to 4.5 hours, but every minute increases brain loss, so don't forget that. Throughout the process, evaluate for a large vessel occlusion because that's just, you know, as you know, the guidelines changed and um, that's been something we're all looking at. So we, as a rule of thumb, we've said if they're in less than six hours since the last known well, NIH of greater than six, affecting more than one body region, you know, Definitely use tele and let's go and let's assess for a, a large vessel occlusion. The six hours I know is changing. As you all know, it, it's now well, the wake-up strokes are, are, are being treated successfully, and I'm very happy about that, but we have not incorporated that yet. I mentioned the electronic EMR and the triage, where we, where we gave them an alert to say, call a stroke, stroke alert on this patient because something's abnormal. And uh, that was one of the process improvements we did that helped things move in a good direction. Administrative changes, we had commitment, we had culture, communication with administration is important, and making your committees useful. So don't just have everybody at the table, but make sure they're useful. I mean, that's when it's important to have CT there. Rather than have the head of x-ray at our meetings, we had our CT techs there, because they were the first line users, they were the ones that were having trouble 
getting it up. Sometimes we didn't do CTAs very often, so that was a challenge when that became important with large vessel occlusions, doing a CTA to rule in, rule out. Sometimes um, we had a tech that hadn't done one before, so getting that education for them. So having the CT tech on our team became very uh, important and very useful. The monitors that we used, the tools. Um, you got to audit every. You've got to audit every stroke that comes through your department in order to know where you can make improvements and, and how the outcome is. So a very simple first line audit, and then translate that into a spreadsheet. I became an Excel expert, and it, it worked for me. It helped me pull stats really quickly. Um, so make your audit tools work for you. Sometimes you have to increase your knowledge in some kind of tech um, tech tool like Excel or something like that to make it work for you. But I, I'd say that's a good investment to go for it and do that because doing it all by hand, is, it, it's not always as useful and it's not uh, definitely not the best use of your time. The registry can help you with some of that. Um, I'm not going to speak to that. I think there was a WebEx already about using it with the guidelines and pulling reports. Uh, so learning what those reports say is really important because I found that there was people, I was putting people into the registry and then in the report it didn't show up and I thought, what happened here? And I had to do some education on what is that report actually pulling. But sometimes my Excel spreadsheet was actually more useful for my, to get the small picture of just my facility and what happened in this, in this case. Reports, the reports go to state, to your RAC or your regional area. Uh, we would report on a broad spectrum to administration and um, the details to the stroke team and to their departments whenever they were affected. Your team leads, um, your champions in each department, your charge nurses and give them incentives, I covered that. So I'm going to stroke ahead here because I'm talking too much. Get with the guidelines is a data registry that helps you a lot. It's got extensive reporting, benchmarking. What I really liked was it would benchmark me against other hospitals that were zero to 100 beds. So I wasn't, mar it wasn't measuring myself against the big comprehensive centers. I was measuring against other hospitals that were the same size as I was. Uh, there was consistency, apples to apples, uh, data tape interpretation and results was consistent. I did have to learn some of that, like why did I, why did that person not qualify for the statistic when I entered them in? I know they did, and and I would find out that it was because there some some idiosyncrasy that that took them out of that measure, and I learned how to figure that out. Education, um, there's a lot of education webinars available to them. And they also give you recognition through awards, which helps you publicity, you get on their website, and also you can use that. We use that as a huge celebration at our hospital. And um, we'll be able to communicate to the community that we are, we're qualified for an award. Apply early, at least one year. Uh, have time to work on your deficiencies. Uh, prep for the survey, do a mock survey. We did that, and that was very helpful in letting us know how we were doing. Uh, make sure you include community education and involvement, and that means simple things like, you know, if you do a, a health fair, take some pictures, email them to yourself. You have a time-stamped email, and it has pictures in it, so that's proof that you did it. It doesn't have to be complex, just, just some kind of time-stamped uh, record of what you have done. And then don't forget to celebrate. And there we got our Get With The Guidelines uh, again in 2018. We got it uh, in 2015, and then... And you might be wondering why we get we get silver plus. It's very hard for us to go to the next level because in order for us to go to the next level, we would have to give six TPAs at a minimum that year, and 80% of them would have to be in 60 minutes. I'll show you our statistics here in a few minutes. Um, this is by year from the year that the baseline is the first column, and then the, the years following. Our NIH reporting went up very quickly and stayed high. Our dysphagia screening uh, went up quite quickly and stayed high. We weren't even doing it, and then it, it got better. Each year it got better. And LDL documentation, we, we weren't recording it, and, and now we weren't doing it consistently on stroke patients, but now obviously we're doing 100% this year, so that's got better. Statin prescribed at discharge. Um, I'm not sure why the baseline was so high, but we got better at uh, making that appropriate because I think the first year when I said statin was prescribed at discharge, I wasn't measuring how much statin was prescribed. And, there, you know, it's gotten more stringent if your LDL is 70, which is hard for any of us if we're not a jogger and a vegetarian. But anyway, if, if you're not on a statin and you're, you've got a, a 
and you've got an LDL of uh, greater than 70, then you need to have documentation about why that didn't happen or have it have a prescribed discharge. So we need to get better at that. Stroke education, we got definitely better at that with that grab and go package um, this last year. Evidently there was some um, staff changes that didn't get educated and there was, we used a quite, a, quite a bit of agency that year and we, we realized that that made a difference and they didn't grab that, that package to go and educate their patients at discharge. That it was very easy for them to grab the package, go teach it, get it signed, but it just didn't get done. IV TPA, treat within 4.5 hours, we got definitely better at that. And you know, you look at this, you think, oh man, that's great, there's a lot of numbers. We're a small hospital. Um, in 2013, there was, um, that was just the, the baseline data. We didn't, uh, we weren't, didn't have a stroke program at that time. 2014, I started measuring, there was no CPAs given. In 2015, there was, there was three. In 16, there was five. And then in 2017, there was seven. So that's not a lot. That's not a lot. And so if you fall out on one, it makes a huge difference in, um, in the statistics. I mean, if you fall out in one of two, that's 50%. So our TPA door to needle time, we did go up in the number of times we gave TPA. We have a lot of pushing with the doctors, a lot of pushing with the team. Call the stroke alert. Why aren't you giving it? Give it, give it, give it. And they would, um, they gave it more often, but getting it given fast was not that often. I did brag about our 38 minutes, but that wasn't um, a very common. We gave a whole lot more in 2016 than we had before, but we only gave one of those within 60 minutes. Some of them were 63 minutes, some were 67, not 60 minutes though. So we, that was the push for 2017, let's get faster. So um, this is the comparison, the IVTPA within three hours compared to other small hospitals. And um, we are on par. If, if, so uh, a small hospital can make a big difference. Organizing your priorities. Briefly, daily, I would go through the ED log of admissions, transfers, and deaths, because that's what they're required to do. And I would check on what was the, what happened to each of those patients on a daily basis. I'd look at that log. The other thing I kept on the side was the stroke alerts, those that were stroke alerts that ended up not being a stroke. It was, you know, a neurological change, but it was glucose or it was something else. But they were calling stroke alerts. I would check and just see what happened with those. I'd enter them in my spreadsheet um, and the log and do a brief audit, but not a detailed audit at that point. Unless it was a TPA, then I would do it right away. Inter interdisciplinary look at the inpatient cases. We have rounds every um, three, days, three days of the week. So I would go and use that as an opportunity for education, but also to assess each person's care, and make sure that they're um, that they were getting their stat, uh, that they were getting their anticoagulants within the 24 hours, that they were getting PTO TST, that they were the NH scales were being um, monitored. Just use that as an education time, and also to look at the the overall care. Weekly, I would abstract cases in detail, initiate the PI loop closure, like plan education, if it's a system-based thing, is there something I can do to change the system, is there something I can do to change the process, or is there something I can do to educate individuals or departments um, to make a better outcome for this. One thing I did on that was uh, I, I would give feedback to the individuals, but I'd always ask them what could what we have done to make the outcome of this better or different, uh, trying to involve them in that process. And then, of course, enter everything into the registry. Monthly, I would run my reports, uh, submit my reports to RAC and STRAC, and state, um, have stroke meetings every other month we had ours. And I would attend the stroke meetings at the RAC monthly just to get more information from them, uh, make sure I was, you know, on par with others uh, that were doing the same thing as us. Uh, we had a support group for stroke in our community, and we had that monthly. Education, I would have something every month, um, a staff meeting where I would help work with something, a mock stroke, a stroke alert, uh, or I would just email educational offerings to doctors or EMS, uh, EMS, um, and then I would always do new employee education. One thing you could do is collaborate with others. I would never have been um, at STRAC. I would never have given this presentation. I would never have done this research if it hadn't been for the other stroke coordinators who had um, worked together with us, and I was just pointing at my name there, that, that we presented that at the National Stroke Conference, and um, I got to have my name on there because I collaborated with others. You don't have to do everything yourself. You can collaborate with others. Utilize the technology, the, stroke, uh, the survey monkey was used. 
Um, so, uh, and then community education. I've already gone over most of this. Use, the, use your newsletter, uh, use your newspaper, use YouTube, um, emails. One way to reach out, you have to include your doctors in your, in your education. So whenever I had an opportunity that came along for a stroke education for doctors, I would just forward that email, forward it to myself, make a copy of it, and there's my education. It's not your responsibility to see that they went, it's your responsibility to see that they were notified of it. One thing we did was we, we joined the local parades with our cars, and we had fast supplied uh, and fast t-shirts and fast magnets, and we put them on the cars, and we handed out fast stickers for people so they could put them on their fridges, and that was our, our education for the community. That's pretty much my presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks, Martha. Um, please press star six to unmute your lines or type in the Q&A section of WebEx for questions. So we did have a question come in. Um, do you do a swallow evaluation on all patients or just those with stroke symptoms? Only those with stroke symptoms. Do you use tele-neuro for your stroke patients' initial evaluation? Only if they fall within the basket within the last six hours. Like if they, if they last onset of symptoms or, or if it's in the last known well within the last six hours. Now, that, that was our, our goal. We have expanded that a little bit to those with wake-up strokes. We included Kelly with wake-up strokes now because of the LDO emphasis that's come in the last year. But if it's beyond the 24 hours, then we don't. Another person asked if you could Send a badge example of your stroke alert cheat sheet and the contents of your grab and go packet. Sure. Um, yes, I can send it to you and you can forward it up. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Again, if you, um, if any of you guys have questions, press star six to unmute your lines or type in the Q and A section of WebEx. Great. Well, if there are no more questions, we would like to thank our speaker one last time for presenting. A couple of reminders before signing off. Please note you will only be able to claim your CE credits at the end of the 15-week series on September 27th. And a copy of today's slides and any handouts will be sent to you within today's call. Thank you, Martha, and we will see all of you next week. Thank you.